Hi everyone, it's Laura. Welcome back to another video about IB psychology. So today we're going to take a look at the cognitive approach to psychology. So that's looking at more so the mind than the brain. So everything we've talked about in the biological um, approach to psychology is more thinking about how we can look at neurons and neurotransmitters and specific physical aspects of the brain, whereas the mind is a little more abstract. So it's thinking about memory, it's thinking about, um, for example, things that can affect memory, emotions, decision making, all that stuff is what fix, fits into the cognitive approach. Um, so specifically what we'll start with today is a topic that's quite an abstract thing to think about in itself, which is schemas. So you might have heard about schemas before. Um, schemas are essentially what we call mental representations of knowledge. So they guide our behavior by basically trying to create a framework from which we can make guesses um, and kind of infer what's going on in the world around us. So we essentially organize the things that we experience and that we perceive using these schemas to guide us. So based on expectations from past experiences, we can then build our knowledge. So schemas are essentially a way of building knowledge, aiding us in making decisions and learning new things, making conclusions. And it's all building up this network of beliefs and expectations. So schemas specifically, we can split into three types. So we have social, self and script schemas. So, so show, social schemas are about the world around us. So it's about other people. So we can, for example, have schemas about social norms. So how you act around other people um, or about groups of people. Basically, it's just not about yourself specifically. Whereas self schemas, they're about yourself. So um, it's pretty much any information relevant specifically to you. And then finally, scripts are the things that are more like habits and routines and behaviors. So we can have scripts about, for example, how to tie our shoelaces. We don't ever really stop anymore and think about how to tie our shoelaces. That's something that's quite innate to us. So we have scripts for behaviors that we essentially learn, or you know what to do if someone throws a ball at you, you'll either protect your face or you'll try to catch it. You wouldn't maybe just stand there and let it hit you in the face because we have schemas to expect what would happen if we let that happen um, and didn't react in any way. So it's basically we, use these frameworks to make our decisions and to act and respond. And we have different ways that we can possibly expand or create schemas, which we specifically group into two categories. So we have assimilation and we have accommodation. So assimilation is adding information to an old schema. So if let's say you're a little kid and you're in a car um, going on a long journey and you look out the window and you already know what a cow is but now you see a different four-legged animal and it's brown so you might think okay i have a schema for what a cow is it's a farm animal and i've seen it before on a road trip so that must mean that this brown four-legged animal is a cow so let's assimilate this add it to our schema for cows so now we're going to expand that schema and suddenly this brown animal fits into that. So next time you saw that animal, you'd think, oh, cow. You wouldn't think, oh, brown four-legged animal. However, if you accommodate the information, you basically create a new schema. So if you see a brown four-legged animal, you might hear your parents say, oh, look at that horse over there. And then you'd think, oh, so this is a different type of animal. So both animals, the cow and the horse, would fit into kind of an overarching schema for uh, maybe animals or animals that you see on road trips but then you'd have a new category specifically for horses, so a new schema. So that's how you can think of schemas really, is it's categories, it's ways we're interpreting the information and kind of trying to spot patterns and make sense of um, things we end up perceiving. So according to schema theory, as active processors of information, then our innate role as humans is to integrate the information that we perceive, so new information, with previously stored information, so the information that we already hold. And that's really all that schemas are. We're just building these huge networks of knowledge to help guide our future knowledge acquisition and make sense of things that we see. And so this can affect all our stages of memory um, and the informa information that we already hold then essentially affects the way that we encode these new memories. 
And there's kind of a bunch of pros and cons to this. So it does save time. It makes it easier. Like I said, that's what forms the basis of habits. It's how we um, basically learn to do things much quicker and efficiently. Uh, it means we process information faster. It means we can organize information about the world, make sense of it. It's automatic. All of that is great, but it can be unreliable. And also we make huge generalizations based on these schemas. Like you saw before with my example of assimilation, you could end up imagining that some type of animal is a whole different animal than what it is because you might overgeneralize. So schemas really are generalizations, but typically they're more on the good side as in it, it helps us. But if we're overgeneralizing, we could be, for example, making stereotypes, which isn't a good thing. So we're making assumptions based on prior experiences, but that doesn't take into account that not everything new you experienced will necessarily be in line with prior experiences. So that's our background to schema theory. Um, what we now are gonna take a look at is a very well-known study on schemas. So you might've heard about this before. It's a very old study by Bartlett and it's called the War of the Ghost Study. So that might ring a bell. And basically, any information that doesn't necessarily align with our schemas, there's not really a schema that, they, that that information slots into, we might forget it, or we might even distort that information so that it fits the schema. So basically, if it doesn't slot into these kind of mental compartments that we have, then we don't necessarily know if we'll actually retain the information. And we'll talk more later about why that could be an issue. Um, or we could also just fill in missing details based on our guesses from the schemas we already hold. So we might kind of grab pieces like, for example, the cow. We might say, oh, I've seen a, a four-legged animal before. It must be this. So we might make assumptions. So what Bartlett wanted to do was to investigate the effect of cultural schemas on memory. So what he did was he had a sample of 20 British adults, so specifically British, so that's also something we can evaluate, is that it's a very narrow population. They were all British, um, and it's also quite a small sample. And what he asked these participants to do was to read a Native American folktale, and it was called War of the Ghosts. And so he asked them to recall it using two different methods. So they, were, they could be asked to recall it using serial reproduction, which is where the first participant would read the story and then write it on paper. And then the next participant would read that paper and write it again. So basically kind of a chain of um, writing out what you'd read. So seeing how much you could recall. Or there was repeated reproduction, which is when the same participant reproduces the story. Um, and they did it about six or seven times. And that was from their own previous reproduction. So it wasn't from reading anyone else's, it was just from their own. And note that I said six or seven times. So that doesn't sound very scientific, does it? And that's because it wasn't really. So this study has been critiqued quite a bit because there was a lack of a clear, rigorous scientific, scientific method. Um, and it wasn't kind of equal across all participants. So some were asked to do it six times, some were asked to do it seven times. It wasn't particularly controlled, which means that we struggled to make what I've talked about many times before is to make these cause and effect conclusions because we can't necessarily deduce if we've been controlling the right variables, if everything's kind of counterbalanced and so on. Um, and equally in line with that, then the time intervals between the reproductions, so when they had to recall the story again, were quite variable. So for some it was 15 minutes and for others it was several years. They had to think back and see um, how much of the story they remembered. So it really wasn't that controlled, which means, again, it's difficult to make very solid conclusions from. So what they found, though, was that both methods, they led to quite similar results, and namely there were two main results. So the more reproductions there were, kind of the further you got in the chain, the shorter the story became. And I'm sure you might have heard that before, or even in a game of Chinese whispers, for example, that kind of as the story goes on, you shorten it and you just kind of tell the key parts. And that's what we call leveling. So it's essentially just almost compacting it to just draw out the key elements and passing that on and you remove what you perceive. And that's the key there, only what you perceive to be as the unnecessary information. So you could really cut out something that someone else would perceive as being important information. 
And at the same time, the other effect was rationalization, which is that people made changes to the story in line with what they were familiar with. So what I mean by that is that hunting seals, for example, in the original, original folktale became fishing in later reproductions, and canoes in the original, original folktale became boats. So people who were the participants in the study, they were rationalizing what they read to adapt it to schemas that they already held so that they could remember it because they might not have remembered hunting seals on its own because that seemed really unfamiliar to them and they would think why would people do that that's not something we do now so the whole point of this and what it demonstrates about schema theory is that memory is really inaccurate and we're always reconstructing our memory based on pre-existing schemas so schemas inform our memory and they make the story more understandable as it did for the participants here um, but because it's adapting it, then it makes it specific to participants' own culture, which means that we lose a lot of key details. Of course, like I said before, though, remember, it, it's an old study, and also there was a lot of discrepancy in how accurate people were asked to be and the time difference in between and so on. Um, but there is a study that actually also has found similar results since. But then again, there wasn't really any motivation either for them to remember this story. It's quite, uh, a, it's a story that's quite far removed from these people, so they don't have any reason to retain the information. They were just asked to for an experiment, um, which means we also just end up having quite low ecological validity, since again the experiment wasn't controlled that rigorously, and quite low generalizability, and that's because again it's it's just not really applicable necessarily to other things without further testing. But the good thing is that it did spur further research on schemas. So what we'll talk about next is a study by Bransford and Johnson, who also wanted to investigate schemas, but specifically to investigate what, what stage of memory that schemas work at. So they had three groups of participants who heard a long story, and the story was about doing the laundry. So this story had about 18 key pieces of information in it, and group one, they heard the title of the story beforehand. So they heard this is going to be about laundry, so something to do with laundry. And group two heard the title after, and group three heard no title at all. So you can kind of already see here, group one will have been able to hear the story with the schema in mind. So they would process the information knowing what they're trying to match it up to. Because if you hear about laundry without actually knowing what it's about, it can be quite a weird story. It would just be kind of about, oh, and then you put um, the items in a, a square which has an opening in it, you press some buttons, etc. So obviously they made it quite, it sounds quite abstract if you don't have that title, but if you have the title, it makes complete sense. So what they found was that um, basically the, the group where the title was given before they were, all of the groups were asked how easy it was and also asked to recall these pieces of information as much as they could. And the group who heard the title before, they thought it was pretty easy and they remembered the most out of all three groups. Whereas the group who heard the title after, they found it very difficult and only remembered 2.6 out of 18 pieces of information. And the group with no title remembered 2.8 and found it difficult. So you might think that's really odd because the second group was told the title just afterwards, so surely they'd be able to remember something. But actually, perhaps what this shows is that if you hear a title after hearing the story, when you're then kind of scrambling to think, oh, how does this title fit the information I just heard? What information, hmm, you try to kind of piece it together. You might be trying to force things into this category and by doing so, you discard all the information that doesn't actually fit that category. So you kind of eliminate information which might have helped you. So that suggests that maybe schemas don't play as much of a role in retrieval since that title after didn't really help those participants. One thing, though, to bear in mind, so this does show us that schemas definitely play a big role in encoding um, memories and information that we're given. We also have to remember there's kind of a lack of ecological validity here because this wasn't it's not a very um, clear study really specifically in the sense that it's not something we'd really do in real life we wouldn't really be testing it this way and also there's not that much generalizability we can't really generalize it 
to other tasks, but also not to other populations, because this was actually a sample, um, which is what we call a weird sample, which is white, educated, industrialized, rich and developed. So quite a classic uh, sample in that sense, which means we will struggle to generalize. Um, and so finally, if we're to kind of to draw all of schema theory together, then we can say that schema theory is good because it shows how we can interpret information and use all this information to make conclusions about information in the world. But the schemas are quite vague and they're not really that strongly defined as well. There's no explanation of where schemas came from. It's not that ecologically valid studies really. And what that basically means is we can't necessarily completely depend on schemas. It's kind of a bit of an abstract um, concept and there's actually no neural basis in the brain for it that we know of. So we need more information in that sense. So I hope you guys have learned something from what we've discussed today. Um, if you're interested in learning more IB psychology or other subjects, check out Len Turner Education and the link below um, and see how you can get tailored lessons online. So get private one-on-one -on -one tuition uh, to help you learn whatever you need within the IB. Thank you very much, and I'll see you next time.